them. So you, uh, now we have a countdown, I think. Is it so, Jonathan? Yes, we are good to go. So, uh, welcome, Henrik. Please have uh, the welcome speech for this event in Yelvar Demonov. Yes, welcome to Yel. Is it on, Jonathan? Yes, welcome to Yelvar and our fine award winning House of Knowledge. Uh, I mean, look at the view. It's not only the building that is nice. You have the weather with you from, from Luleå yesterday. Today we had rain here. Uh, and also welcome to what we think the center of the industry's green transition. Obviously, I'm not Begitta. Begitta could not attend to today's meeting. My name is Henrik Elvebo, and I'm the deputy mayor of Gällivare. All of northern Sweden, even more in Gällivare, we have fantastic opportunities that comes with the opportunity that comes with the investment degree in the industry is making to switch to fossil free value change. A change that opens up and creates opportunities, business opportunities, the availability of free, fossil free electricity, the rapid development of hydrogen, and the possibilities with waste heat to create fantastic condi conditions throughout Northern, for development throughout northern Sweden. Today we also will release news that further shows the potential uh, of, of the green transition, which you also will receive information of today. Yeah. Once again, welcome to Gällivare, the center of the green transition. Thank you. Thank you, Henrik. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, some intense hours here in Gällivare, so we will um, um, we'll have your questions. It will be good. You can, uh, when we have the four speakers, so please have some questions for them. Uh, so the agenda for today, I will show you. Uh, the first point is the done. Henrik has welcomed you to, to Gällivare. And after that, uh, will me and Alexander Kult some introduction of the business region and Gällivare as, as, a, as a place. After that, we have three really interesting speakers that will tell you all about the transition we're doing in Gällivare for the green, green transition. The first one is Rick and Mackie. Yeah, they will present themselves when they have the, the speaking point. After that, we have Christian uh, Ryman from Hybrid. And 11.20, we have Jan Lundgren from LKB. Then we break for lunch. And the lunch will be served at the same place that you have the Swedish Fika. And then you will get back here to 12.20. You want to be back at 12.20 because we have some news that are really interesting in this green transition. So lunch and then after that 12.20 here. Wrap up uh, 12.45 and then jump in the bus and, and going for Kirna. So please, Alexander, welcome up. Thank you, thank you. And welcome to Gällivare. Sometimes uh, me and Roger, we have to pinch ourselves uh, just to see. We are now in the forefront of the green transition in the mining industry. So we thought to ourselves, how will we meet this? What, what can we do as a society to meet this transition that is going on here in Gällivare? I think uh, yesterday we was in Luleå and I heard lots of keynote speakers and I think the takeaway from that was actually we are needed to change. We are actually needed to drive the green transformation. And that is really important for the future and for our children. So that is what we are going to talk about these hours when you are here in Yelvar. What we are doing for that. And we thought we can't do this alone. We need partnership. We need to come together and work together to make this possible. And that's why we, the municipality of Gällivare and business region of Gällivare, came together and started what we call the process. Redo the future, or as you say it in Swedish, redo för framtiden, that is directly transferred, read, read, ready for the future. And this is the process that we work in. Uh, and we, we take all of the society in, the young ones, the elder ones, to meet up and say, how will we, will we make this green transition possible here in Gällivare? So, 
We have the first speakers. Uh, maybe you switch the, uh, the head. No, actually, Roger, we so? have some overall objectives. Oh, sorry for that. For, of course, we have the overall objectives. What is the uh, goals we have for the future? Exactly. Please start you. Alexander. We sat down. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to meet this in the right way. So we took from in front of three objectives. One, we have to grow. We are now around 17,500 inhabitants. We need to grow to 20,000 in 2026. So pretty rapid growth for a town and mun municipality this size. And uh, the second one, um, I, yeah, I remember it. The second one is actually, <laughs> is actually unique, I think. Uh, we are aiming for increase the, the permanent uh, job opportunities in Gällivare with 2,500 more jobs, permanent jobs, in Gällivare to the 2030. Yes. And if we are going to grow, we need more housings. So obviously, the last objective is more housing. We need to build 1,200 new housing until 2026. And probably we need to double that in the early 2030s. So here in Gällivare, we have to have a rapid growth to meet the green transition. We heard yesterday from LKAB only the building of hybrid technology here in Gällivare, where it starts need 3,000 workers to make that possible. To make that possible, we need to come together, work active with housing to make it all go around. Good start, I think. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, we have four really interesting presentations. The four presentation is aiming for, tell us what's the change? What's the change for green transformation? And um, as I said, we had Boliden first out, and then we have hybrid development uh, and um, LKB. And we have a really interesting presentation after lunch. Uh, so I think uh, that one is also to come. We are almost done here. So please, Rickard from Boliden, the stage is yours. Can you hear me okay? Okay, uh, Dr. Rickard Mack, I'm from uh, employee of Boliden. I'm going to do a quick corporate introduction and I'm going to talk to our climate strategy. It's not on the agenda, but I thought you would be interested in a few slides on the climate strategy. And after that, I will talk about the autonomous deployment that I'm right now leading in ITIC. Uh, so I've been with Boliden for five years. And one of the reasons I moved to Boliden was because of that green transition that we're in and the climate ambitions. And before that, I worked with another Swedish company for for a long time, uh, I also worked on climate transitions. So I actually worked with the first uh, battery electric hybrid wheel loader back in 20, 2006. So I've been with, with Volvo before, and I like the quote from, from the old Volvo president that he said 50 years ago, and it's very true for Boolean as well. We're part of the problem, but also part of the solution. Uh, so if I look at Boolean, we are... Uh, a world, uh, a world leading metal producer. We are in base metals, so we see LKAB and uh, hybrid here with an iron ore. We're in base metals. Uh, copper we produce here in ITIC as, uh, as the main product, and of course, copper is really important for, for the society and the transition. And you see the picture also of the electrified haul trucks that we use. So we implemented that solution in ITIC a couple of years ago. And actually, 90% of the copper in the wires that we use here is from the pit behind it. So that's really a proof of the source of that transition. And of course, we, we work on the full value chain. So we start in, in exploration, we work in mining, we do the smelting ourselves, and we also do the recycling. So we're Swedish biggest recycler of electronic waste as well in, in our smelters. Uh, looking at the company, 6,000 employees, uh, we are here in ITIC. We also have an open pit in Kevitsa that produces nickel, also, of course, something that's very much into the new transition. 
If we have the bull in an area which is precious metals, and then we have garpen, barium, tara, that are zinc mines. And then we have our smelting facilities. Uh, so runners are uh, big on copper, but also recycling of, of electronic waste. And we have Berise down at the bottom, which is actually more or less every lead battery in Sweden goes to Berise and becomes recycled. And we started back in 1924, so a hundred year old company. Uh, the purpose we have that is to actually provide the metals that we need for this transition. And we see that we are really, really critical part in, in creating those new value chains, getting the material out, and also supporting then all these new, uh, new companies here with, uh, with raw material. Uh, and we also say for generations to come, and what we mean with that is the recycling part. So we, when we put metal from the, the ground up into the society, it should remain there and circulate. But since we grow, recycling won't solve everything. We need to, to put in new content. And of course, we try to be the most climate friendly and respected player in the industry. And then looking at ITIC, uh, where I'm actually since a couple of weeks part of the management team of ITIC. Uh, it's uh, the most productive open pit copper mine in the world. If you look at how much we produce per per employee, so high degree of automation already today. Uh, we produce around 40 million tons of, of ore, equivalent amount of waste, so around 90 to 100 million ton production. So that's similar to all quarries in Sweden together. Uh, and of course, uh, electrification, you already saw that, that work we do on electrification with the whole trucks. So, so that is up and running, we're extending the system in, in ITIC, but we're also establishing it in Kvitsa. I think that's really important for us. And then of course, in the underground operation, we also work a lot on electrification. Uh, so if I am topic a bit, do you know about Boliden? And talking about the climate strategy, Actually, this is very fresh, actually. So, so, so not everyone in the company have actually seen this document, but we have done a big work now uh, leading up to this. So in the end of April, we, we actually had the first climate strategy ready and approved by, by the board of directors. And what we have done here is, of course, we have uh, the climate strategies. We have done a lot of uh, technologies, scouting, looking at what, what's right for our, our business, uh, making sure that we, we adopt what, what we can and that we lead that development. And then also we have been sitting with each of the, the business units, ITIC, Kvitsa, Garpen, where we looked at individual roadmap for each operation. What do we need to do in our site? So it's not like only corporate drive. We are also getting each business unit actually do commitments and drive this. Uh, and the target we have is a uh, 40% reduction until uh, 2030. So uh, fairly ambitious, and of course that's not the end of it. That's not the end game. But that's what we're, we're driving hard for. Uh, and if you look at, at this, we, we, we have decided not to buy certificate of origin for, for electricity. So we will use the grid mix that we have here. We believe other need to fix the electricity supply, but, but we need to make sure we use it in an efficient way and that we minimize the usage of electricity. But of course, electricity is, is the best way to, to replace fossil fuels. But that's not going into this. And I think what we can see here on, on, on this graph is also, of course, that the, the big, big source is diesel. That's really what we, what we need to work on first. And we have a lot of other things, of course, that we, we work on heating of the mines with propane and, uh, and other fossil sources, but, uh, but really it's diesel. And then we have a problem with, with Irish energy mix coming into this. So here in Sweden, it's really good grid mix. Uh, Finland is decent, Ireland is leave it at that. <laughs> so, so, so. Uh, and then I think how we see the forecast then is that we looked at this as I said, with each business unit, each business area, and, and we believe we will reach this. 
And of course, initially here it's a blend of biodiesel. We have that uh, reduction requirement here in Sweden that you know about, where we blend renewable fuel in in the diesel. However, we don't believe it's it's a long-term solution. Long-term solution to just go for that renewable fuel. We, we have a shortage. If we start using it here, it becomes a problem somewhere else. So, so we, we are not actively driving that, but we're following the, uh, the reduction requirements from, uh, from the law. So what we need to do then, on top of that, is uh, the battery electric whole trucks for ITEC. And here we really push all the OEMs and manufacturers, so talking with Komatsu and Caterpillar, reminding them all the time we need battery trucks. We can't buy more diesel trucks. Maybe this year, but not next year. So we really push that transition into getting, I mean, we have those power lines, but that's only part of the whole cycle. And we are not connected to those. We, we need a battery electric. And then, of course, we talked about Tara. We need to solve that somehow. Get the electricity into the Tara mine. Uh, and then we need uh, on the underground operation to go into battery electric. But there we see the products are more mature, so we are it, it gets more commercially available and we can actually start fleet replacements. But that's not the case op in open pit. And then the f next big thing that is coming that, uh, that we are leaning towards. We have not officially done that, but we are going to this. I would be very surprised if we not very, very soon announce that we will go to these science-based targets. And we have looked a lot on the scope one and, the, and scope two, the more direct emissions, but now we are actually talking to, to the supply base, starting at looking at those scope three emissions from the supply chain. Uh, so for example, I had uh, Michelin here on Tuesday, their management team for the tire manufacturer discussed exactly this scope free. How do we get into that? How do we make sure that, that we see everything? And that's the new thing that will come. And in a way that will help us as well, because we have two new products on the market. So this is a problem. We are a price taker. As a metal producer, you're normally a price taker from the, the metal exchange. We get a market price, and we don't really differentiate. But what we try to do now is that we launch two new products. So if you're manufacturing anything, you want to do a life cycle assessment of your product, we can get the certificate that we can produce with given CO2 impact. So you can buy, drive, or buy this low carbon copper or low carbon zinc, get the certific a certificate of origin, and then you can count on that in your, your equations. And we believe this is needed to really get the differentiation in the marketplace so we don't compete with others that don't think sustainability. We need to, to compete with others that see the value in the transition. I'm not sure on time. I don't see a clock, but... <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, so then talking about... Uh, Automation, this is actually what I, I drive right now, as a main part of the day at least. And it's not, it's not really only for climate, it's actually also something we need to do here in Gällivare because it's so hard to find employees that are competent and skilled, also in the pit, driving machines. We need to move a city, we need to build a hybrid, we need to extend our mine operation, we have LKB extending their mine operations, we're building infrastructure. It's just really, really hard to find even labor. And so that's why we work on, on automation as well, because we need to, to release those resources into other things. And looking at the automation project, I think it's really important. It's not the technology challenge, it's not the technology project. It is actually a change project. It's a change management of the way we mine. So we need to get the people with us, and we need to get the organization uh, to be ready to receive this technology. And then, of course, there is a couple of, of cool things for a PhD to dive into, but, but still, it's not that that's a big thing. It's a change management. And the reason we do it, of course, one really important thing is 
is the safety. And we have had a couple of uh, really close calls in, in the operation here. It's really big vehicles. One of those is around 550 tons loaded. So it's really hard to see small vehicles. So we have had a couple of, of contacts that could have been really bad. We also have trouble with, with safety just in the winter condition. You need to climb those stairs every time you change operator. You need to go up, you need to go down. It's icy, it's windy. We have a lot of slip and falls. And the best way to, to improve safety here is to, to get those operators or reduce number of people around this production area. And then, of course, it drives business benefits as well. And that's the utilization of the assets. So one of those mine trucks is maybe five, six million dollars uh, in, in cost. And of course, you don't want that to stand. You don't want to stand when you do a shift change. You don't want it to stop when you change operator. You don't want it to go the wrong way. You don't want it to drive too slow because the operator don't really want to get there because it's if I get there too soon, I need to take another round before my lunch break. <laughs> so you really need to kind of find those benefits as well. Uh, and that is the consistency in speed, so some of the graphs you don't need to understand them, but that's the distribution of speed that we have on whole cycles today. So with human operators, some drive really fast, a lot drive the similar speed, and some do something really stupid and drive really, really slow. Uh, and the automation system will do the same thing every time. So we believe that will, it will drive the overall efficiency. And then, of course, the, uh, the maintenance aspect of this no misuse, no accidents, incidents where you drive into things, no abuse of the machine. And then, of course, the other challenge that we get back to then again, Gällivare, this region, how do we secure the new skill set? And this is really a big change here and a big challenge that we I'm hiring right now. So if you go into open positions, please apply. <laughs> But, but it's a challenge that we have here that we get a, new, a lot of new roles in the organization. We need to find people for these roles. And of course, we, we work a lot in continued education. We're really happy that we have this type of school building because that helps people be attracted by actually going to, uh, to school. Then we need to get a bit more of them through university. The problem we have is that here it's really attractive to get the job directly after high school. So we have a bit too few that, that gets out and come back. I'm going to go into more detail on that one. Safety, talked about that. So what we have done is that we, uh, we have signed up with Komatsu for their system. So it's a proven system, and I said, not a technology project. It's a lot of technology, but it's a a proven system. We have it in Australia and Canada uh, and Chile. Uh, and, and we also have it in, in Arctic conditions in, in Canada. But we, we are first into European legislation, so it's going to be the first time we see a market. It will be the first time we bring it into regulated Europe. A uh, lot of safety layers uh, that are technical, not our problem, but our problem or our challenge make sure our operating procedures are in place, that we do the, the right thing, everyone does the same thing. We are consistent in how we mine and how we work. And also that we have competent people. So to get into this automation area, we need to, to get the skill set to the right level. That's a vital part of the safety. If you bring people that are not trained, you bring risk. And then, of course, in, in doing that, we, we, we use the best in the industry that we have here in Sweden. So we use Subcombi Tech, we use Railers, we use external support to make sure this is 100% right. And I get into my last slides here, second to last, but just high level time schedule what we're doing. So we have actually been on this project for actually, not nine months at least. Uh, and we have done the preparations and planning, so we have had the specialists here. We looked through everything in the mine, the operations, the network coverage, 
the geometries, and there is no, and of course the regulation space, so there is no showstoppers. So we paused that first phase and decided now we invest. So now we are actually building a new control room, we're building a new training facility, we are building access control in the mine, making sure we have like a safety zone. And then in the beginning of next year, quarter one, we'll get hardware to site, we start converting the equipment, putting sensors on them, putting in the system, installing the servers. And then shortly after that, then we, we start the system then in, in March and April, validate the functionality, make sure it works as it should. And then we start uh, an operation that is mainly for training of the staff. We're going to run a few months, just no production target, safety first, make sure people get trained so it becomes like a playground in the mine. But after that, then we're of course going to move into uh, productivity trials, uh, performance trials, making sure we train more people, and then also hand over the ownership back to the, the normal operation. Uh, and the last slide, then, the challenges we manage is, so of course, we need to create a safe work environment. And it's one thing that it is safe, it needs to be perceived as safe. So we need to make that sure that everyone that comes to work feel that I'm in a good place. H here I feel safe. So we have that part as well, and a lot of that is knowledge and training, but it's also the way we, we set up the system. Uh, organization, work processes, I mentioned a bit that we need to tune how we set up the organization, how we work in the mine. Uh, we need to establish a lot of infrastructure. It's a challenge now, as I said, new buildings, compete for contractors, try to order an excavator next week, nearly bare. Tell me if you find a phone number that works. <laughs> uh, training and recruitment, uh, I mentioned that it's, it's a big thing. And I'm really, really happy that we at Bolin are investing now in a dedicated building for this. We will have two operator simulators, two dedicated classrooms, uh, space for the trainers. So it's a new building on the premises that's going to be, be built now in, in September. And then change management. We, we have done training for the managers, how do people react to change. M make sure that people are listening to what the organization is, is saying and bring that back. Making sure that we're out there. Uh, we worked a lot with the union, and actually the union is really positive here in Gällivare. They see we invest in Gällivare. It's the future. It's very few that are afraid of losing their job, and that helps this type of transition. Uh, and then we are working hard to find ambassadors in the organization, people that are informal leaders in the organization that can get a bit more information, that can make sure we don't have rumors in the organization, that can be the ones that, that people talk to when, when they meet. That's what we're doing, doing right now. So, thank you. I think we can open the floor for some questions, so raise your hand. Hi. Uh, yeah, firstly, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask about the electrification of some of the heavy vehicles, because I think when it comes to passenger cars, I think most people have come to the view that electrification is the route, and um, maybe Toyota is still trying to use a hydrogen vehicle, but most uh, people think electrification is, is the future, but when it comes to heavy vehicles, particularly in cold climate, um, you know, there are some question marks over electrification and some people think hydrogen is a solution. So do you have any performance issues and, you know, what, what was your thinking on that topic? Uh, I, I think we have had a lot of those discussions. And I, the, the basic thinking is that if battery works and you have access to electricity that's clean, Better is better. In the mines where you don't have a good energy mix, you don't have the grid connectivity, then you get into a different situation. B but for us, if battery works, it's better than hydrogen because we don't need to use electricity to create hydrogen, to create movement. We can use the electricity in the battery and then create movement. So, we, so we overall efficiency of the vehicle is better with, with battery. But there is challenges. We might need battery heat. We need charging and we need solutions, but 
the battery works better is better for us. Thank you. Some more questions? Can I just yeah. add to your comment there? Please. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Lorenzo from, from MIM, and I can, okay. I can just comment. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. I will switch it on. So. Hello? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so I'm coming from uh, MIN Energy Solutions, and I can just confirm that we have actually met with Komatsu, uh, and they are researching uh, if they are to to uh, consider hydrogen as a fuel for uh, for uh, their upcoming uh, heavy vehicles. So they do have a program to, for that. So maybe that is not the solution for for Boliden, but uh, there might be other applications where this is feasible and, and the best uh, solution. So I just wanted to, to, to comment on it. Thank yeah, you. I, I think what we envision, and what at least if I talk Komatsu, so then since you brought them up, we are talking power agnostic. So the idea is that you make a base truck and you can put different power plants on it. So you can have a, a diesel power plant for people that think that they're interested. Uh, and you can have a battery power plant or you can have a fuel cell power plant, but 90% of the vehicle in itself can remain. So, so that's the way you do like a, a square package and then you decide if you put in what type of power module you opt for. Mm. Thank you. We have uh, room for one more open question. Mox, please. Yes. Uh, I think you can hear me. Yes, thank yeah, you. Please. Uh, I was wondering if you could please comment on the market for your low carbon copper and zinc. Yesterday we heard about the market being ready to pay a premium for zero carbon products. And of course, that's an easy marketing decision. But I'm wondering, in, 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 is your market prepared to pay a premium for lower carbon, or uh, is there pushback from the marketing department saying this is a tougher sell? Uh, we are fairly new on the market with this, and, and I actually haven't received feedback exactly on how, uh, how it goes, but the, the, the rumors I heard is the interesting discussions going on. So I think we, we see uh, uh, interest, then, then what's the price premium? Maybe we, we also need to discuss that with the customers and see with the market what's the right price level and what is, is the right thing. But I think the important thing is that we start creating a differentiation in the market. It might not be that initially the difference needs to be this big, but we need to start creating these different products. We can't have copper as one global product. We need to create diversification in the marketplace somehow even if the price difference is small in the beginning, at least then we can start discussing the value and we can start monetizing some of the investments that we need to do and get financing for some of the investments we, we want to do. Good. Big hand for Rick and Mackie from Bolivia. Thank, Thank you, Becker. And now we have a, a just a switch for the next presentation. Um, it's Christer Ryman from Hybrid Development AB. Um, and we will switch slide here. I'm ready. You're ready to go. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, my name is My name is Christer Riemann. I work with uh, all four hybrid development, which is the joint venture company equally owned by SSAB, LKAB and Vattenfall. I am uh, head of regulatory affairs, but despite that I have a, actually have a technical background. So uh, I have a I am a metallurgical engineer. I studied at the Royal Institute in Stockholm uh, many years ago. And when I attended the classes at the Royal Institute, we were taught that there are two ways, basically two ways to produce steel. Either you use iron ore from the crust of the earth, <laughs> mined uh, uh, iron ore, or you produce uh, steel from recycled material, from collected scrap that you collect in the society. Uh, at that time, we didn't talk very much about circular economy, but today that, that is known as the circular economy. You, 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 you recycle the material. Uh, 
after my studies, I actually moved to Gällivare, and I worked for a couple of years at LKAB uh, as a research engineer and uh, with product development. And at that time, this was the 1990s, the global production of, of, uh, of steel was 800 million tons uh, annually. And today, it is 1.8, 1.9 billion tons annually. So that is quite a difference, actually. <laughs> Uh, during my working career, the, the, the steel production globally has, has more than doubled. So if, if I were to produce steel today for, 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 the, for the global demand, if I were to look for, for steel scrap, I would typically look for for the products that we produced in the 1990s, they, they, they used car, the scrapped cars, uh, end of life ha household uh, appliances, some construction scrap, and so on. Uh, and, and, and then I think that you realize that if the demand today is 1.8 billion, and what we produced like 20, 25 years ago was 800 million, then the, the mass balance doesn't end up for a circular economy. And in a nutshell, that is why we, we in a f during a foreseeable future, several decades in front of us, see that at least half of the steel, global steel production will be based on iron ore. And, and with, with the, the insight then that we will need to produce more than half of the steel demand with iron ore, uh, then there is, that, that, that is why we are actually working with the, the decarbonization of the iron ore based steel making. Uh, my presentation today is uh, in, in two parts. It's, it's, uh, it's a hybrid 101. It, it's more uh, what are the relationships and the, and the numbers in, in hydrogen based steel making. And the second uh, part is, is about uh, the industrialization. How, what, what kind of industrialization path or our own demonstration project that we are planning for the next years. So if we start with hybrid 101, uh, hybrid stands for uh, hydrogen breakthrough iron making technology. You have probably heard of it. It's, uh, in, in this slide, it's, it's a very simplified uh, message. That is that if you use, if you replace carbon with hydrogen, then you, when you produce iron, then you will get water instead of carbon dioxide. That, that, is, that is the meaning of this. Iron ore, hydrogen makes iron and water. Now this is a very, apprehensive, uh, easy to understand message, I think. And I think that is, that is part of actually why our project has been so successful because anyone, a, a lay person can pitch this. And uh, even the glo world leaders can, can t talk about this and, and retell this story for other leaders without missing the, the point, I think. So, so this is the very simplified message. But if we go into the technology itself, it's, uh, it's a quite different technology compared to the traditional way of making iron and steel, because we need, in, in this context, to add hydrogen production. We need to produce hydrogen uh, with fossil-free electricity, preferably. Uh, instead of, of having the preparation of other reductants uh, to reduce iron ore. And other reductants are, are coking, coking coal uh, used for the blast furnace process, or natural gas, or actually fossil gas that is used for the normal direct reduction processes. Uh, we, we want to get rid of that, and we want to use hydrogen instead. Uh, the main uh, mit mitigation potential, we are in the hybrid project, we are working with the different 
process steps in the value chain. I will come back to that. But, but the main uh, mitigation potential is in the iron making process. Uh, and traditionally, uh, the, the dominating process is the blast furnace process that produces hot metal. We want to replace that, to substitute that with the direct reduction process uh, where we produce sponge iron. And just to explain uh, sponge iron, uh, if we are producing the iron ore in, in a solid phase, uh, that is direct reduction, uh, then we, put in, in our case, we, we put in iron ore pellets, the small balls, we put them into a reactor, it reacts with hydrogen, and then it, it, it becomes metal, solid metal, uh, without the oxygen. And it exits the reactor in exactly the same shape as it entered the reactor. Uh, the difference is that it is 30% lighter, uh, because you have removed 30% of the mass. And then you can imagine that this, it's lighter, uh, it's, uh, it's rather porous, and that is why we call it, why, why it in Swedish it's called spongy then, swamp. Uh, so, so sponge iron is that it, 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 is, it appears to be spongy. Uh, it, it's very, it has very high surface area. Uh, it's kind of reactive. Uh, it can oxidize again, especially if it gets in contact with water. Therefore, it's, it's quite common. A quite common procedure is that if you want to to, to make it more resistant or, or handleable, then you can compact it, and then you get the, the HPI, the briquettes that you see here. That is that is the same material, but you have compacted it and closed the pores, uh, and then you get a product that is more durable and you can, it's e more easy to store and, and you can transport it by, by sea. Okay. Uh, and, and then some words about the, the processes. The, the illustrations are very schematic. Uh, those of you who has some knowledge about chemistry or, or, or remember the chemistry lessons, you might recall counter-current reactors, where you have uh, two streams meeting in a reactor, and in, 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 in all these variants of the iron reduction processes, you have a reduction, uh, reducing gas and uh, iron oxide that meets in a reactor, and the reaction takes place in the reactor, and you get metal, and you get an off-gas. In the blast furnace process, where you where you form your reducing gas from, from coking coats, um, th there is a mixture, actually a mixture of, of carbon and hydrogen that, that uh, makes the reduction happen. But the carbon is, is uh, dominating in the blast furnace process, and that is why the, the CO2 uh, emissions are up in average around two tons uh, per ton of, of, of metal in that process. If you go to the natural gas based or, or the fossil uh, uh, direct reduction processes, then there's also a mixture because you reform the, the fossil gas and you form uh, CO and, and hydrogen, H2, and uh, uh, they can be in equal parts. It could be 50-50 or in some cases uh, hydrogen is, is, is in, in the majority, it's like 50 to 70 percent. Depends on the source of, of your gas. What we are trying to accomplish in, in the hybrid development is, is the 100 percent uh, hydrogen technology, 100 percent hydrogen process. And uh, and, 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 and okay. We want to go 100% hydrogen. What, what is, is, this, is, is this a big deal or not? Do we have to develop a new process? If you look on these processes uh, from a chemical point of view, they, they, the reactions are quite different. Uh, uh, you have different equilibriums. The chemical equilibrium is different. And in, in our case, we think that the, the, 
the, the, the driving force for the hydrogen uh, reduction of iron ore is, is higher at higher temperatures. So, so hydrogen utilization benefits from high, higher temperatures. There is also a different heat balance depending on which uh, reaction you, you, you take because when you use hydrogen, uh, okay, when you use hydrogen, uh, uh, the, the reaction is endothermic, so you need to, to, to put in more heat. And then there's also a kinetic uh, difference because hydrogen is, is the smallest molecule in the universe. Uh, I will, this is just a conceptual picture. I don't know, those of you who are into mass balances might already have, have, have calculated that it takes 1.4 tons of, of iron ore to make one ton of iron and that it takes roughly 50 kilograms of hydrogen to, to reduce uh, this amount of iron. And it takes half a ton of water to produce this 50 kilograms of hydrogen. Uh, I will skip this. Uh, just a few words. I will not go into the piloting acti activities uh, in today's presentation, except that I will mention just that two days ago we had an uh, inauguration of our new hydrogen storage in, in Luleå. And this is a new pilot plant where we will uh, develop knowledge, very exciting knowledge about how to store hydrogen, uh, which is very important in our future production system. So, some words about the hybrid demonstration phase then. Uh, the target or the goal of this demonstration phase is then to take us from the experimental phase that we are in now and industrialize this process and, and increase the technology readiness levels up to the to, to eight and nine. Uh, and we see that we are going to start to produce commercial volumes of of uh, sponge iron and steel in 2026, and then it will gradually increase uh, up to f f during the coming years. Uh, we have three steps or three parts of this demonstration phase. It is to produce fossil free pellets. It will be done here in Yellowvare at LKB. We will produce fossil free sponge iron, hydrogen and fossil free sponge iron. It will also be done here. At, uh, in Yellowvare at the LKB premises, and we will produce fossil free steel, and that will be done by SSAB in Oxelösund or south of here. So, this is the pelletizing step. We will scale up the hydrogen production, uh, which is a challenge in itself. This is a, this is a picture of, of, of the current. Uh, hydrogen facility in Luleå, it's 4.5 megawatts, and what we are aiming for here is more than 100 times bigger. So it, we need to see some significant development in this area. This is just a conceptual picture of, of uh, how the reduction will look like. This is the electric arc furnace where we will make steel in Oxelösund. The important thing uh, with electric arc furnaces, that this is actually a mature process. It has been used, this is the process that is normally used to, to melt the steel scrap, the, the other route. We want to use it to, to produce uh, the, 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 the ore-based uh, steel. Uh, and, and the thing is that this will allow for SSAB to, since they will continue to have an ore-based uh, feed. Uh, it will allow them to produce this, uh, st crude steel with a similar analysis and a similar uh, low amount of low impurities as if they were still having the blast furnace. Uh, this will lead to lower CO2 emissions. I think that I, my time is slipping, so I will go to my summary. Uh, what I try to say here is, one, hydrogen enables uh, the conversion to sponge iron and steel in a fossil-free manner. The second thing is that the circular 
system or the scrap-based system is not, will not solve the problem for us because there is not enough scrap and you cannot use scrap to produce every kind of steel grain. And the third thing is that the hybrid demonstration project that is coming, it contains the three steps. Two of them here in yellow or the third one in, in Oxelostone. And then my, this is my final slide. Uh, we have got quite some attention during the spring because we, we had, as the only project in our sector, got a significant grant from the European EU Innovation Fund. Uh, we think that this is kind of an acknowledgement to us that we are capable and credible and uh, a forerunner in, in this uh, uh, decarbonization of the steel industry. Thank you. Interesting presentation, Christer. Thank I you. think I will open the floor for some questions. I think we have some. Um, so we start here. Hi, my name is Osa Johansson. I'm from Estrange Space Center. But I'm just wondering, um, as I understand it, uh, when you produce hydrogen, you get a lot of excess heating. So I just wonder, what are you going to do with all that excess heating? Is there any fun projects around that? I, I think that there are a lot of ideas on what we can do with excess heat and also with the excess oxygen. That, because when we split the, the water, you, get also, you also get oxygen. So we get hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, and I think that, that, is, that it's a very interesting question, and uh, it's something that we are working with. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> it, it's, uh, I, I think that the solution will be, I think it's location dependent what you actually can do with this, these kind of products, because you cannot transport them for huge distances. You have to find some local solutions on how to utilize this. But it, it has, a, it has a great potential and a great value that I think that you should utilize in some way. You say you need a lot of heat for your endothermic reaction. <coughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, that's another kind of heat normally. <laughs> we have a uh, last open questions, please. Mox, you have the, always the last question. So. Uh, I hope not. Uh, thank you very much. Very informative uh, presentation. Just two-part question. Firstly, is it possible for us to get a copy of these presentations? There was so much information there. I would love to study in more detail. Uh, if you can reflect on that, and please, if we could get that. The second part is I noticed uh, the alkaline electrolyzers. Will that likely to be the technology choice for hybrid going forwards? We haven't decided on the technology. We are, of course, we are looking very much in detail into the different options that are on the market. And uh, there might be also s that there is not one solution, that maybe there is a combination of different uh, technologies uh, because they have different characteristics. But uh, you are totally correct that in, in the pilot phase we are running alkaline electrolyzers. So, big hand for Christer Riemann. So we have a switch for the next speaker, um, and the next speaker is from LKB, and um, his name is Jan Lundgren. He will present himself just just shortly. I will switch for the for your slides, Jan. So welcome, Jan. Thank you, Jan Lundgren from LKB. I'm head of the transformation team, which is a team of a, around 250 highly dedicated engineers, researchers, project managers that will focus not only on the transformation, but also to improve our existing processes. And uh, we have uh, grouped uh, transformation in three different areas. Um, we are, uh, of course, as Christer mentioned, the market for steelmaking 
needs fresh iron ore. And I guess that's our sweet spot in the market. We have launched some years ago an extensive exploration program that has been quite fortunate. And uh, we have secured both reserves and resources that make, make us quite confident that we can manage this transformation based on those resources. And uh, we are working in parallel tracks, different technologies. Um, Christel has mentioned one of those together with the hybrid development team. I will explain a little bit more of our part in that. And also we have another stream that we think is quite critical for us to succeed with is to contribute more to the circularity by uh, extracting critical minerals from our today mine waste. So I will guide you through what we have uh, in our mining program and also for our um, future processes of products for CO2 free steel making. Um, and uh, I will focus in the end on what we are doing here in Gällivare. LKB, the, the main operations are located up here in the ore fields in the north with Gällivare, Svappavara and Kiruna, Kiruna as the main operating sites. The strategic intent from us is to be CO2 free mid 40s with, with all the production. And as mentioned by Bo Liden, we also have the same drivers to go into increased autonomous operations. And uh, we see also that we need to uh, use more electrical power to get into the CO2 free processes that we need. And uh, when it comes to mining, we are uh, planning of introducing the battery vehicles underground here in in Gällivare in the Malmberget mine. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the CO2 free uh, sponge iron production, we will also start that program here in Gällivare. And uh, in the long in the long term we also will increase our operations not only from uh, magnetite but also develop processes for hematite and also recover phosphorus from appetite so that's the the main targets we have and uh, time wise you saw that in the crystal uh, presentation from the hybrid development. We are aiming to demonstrate uh, this uh, hybrid technology in an industrial scale with a start here in, in uh, Gällivare. And then continue the development together with the hybrid development pilot plant in Luleå for the next plant also here in Gällivare. So it's we are building the capacity module by module, so to say, and also uh, developing the technology and the necessary processes under, under our way. We are also, of course, looking into the mining capacities in uh, our operating mines today and also add some new uh, mining capacities enable us to actually finance this transformation. And today we are in a kind of bulk business. We are selling volumes of pellets for blast furnaces or direct reduction with natural gas based units. And uh, as Christian mentioned the, the product, how it will be handled and so on, will inflect the di distribution and perhaps also 
um, we will have some new customers in the future because of this uh, transformation. Here in, in uh, Gällivare, we have the Malmberget mine. It's an underground mining operation. We are producing on, on um, ten different, more than 10 different ore bodies. We have a main haulage or transport level here in Malmberget at 1250 meters below the surface. We have significant reserves and resources in place and we are looking into how to increase the production, how to place the new main level and also uh, the, to construct the necessary infrastructure to actually access the ore bodies. Uh, today we are mainly operating with a sub-level caving which has a quite huge impact on the surface so we are investigating in, in different methods, like uh, block caving, with, which is in, in operations today in some places in the world, and also developing new methods like raised caving. So that is undergoing right now. And in order to increase the production in here in Gällivare, Malmberget mine, we need to invest in a new hoisting system as well. So this is underway. Svappavara is another mine site. We run an open pit in Levenjemi today, but we are investigating the possibilities to go underground, to actually open up uh, two, two mines in parallel. Uh, together, Levenjemi and Gruberg, it has uh, si significant resources. And also here, it's uh, the same as in Malmberget, it's magnetite and it's also hematite. So we need to develop processes for hematite as well. And uh, also different mine level, um, um, mining methods and a new hoisting system. In Kiruna, we have worked a lot the last couple of years to define the resources in the per year or bodies and, and we see that we have uh, in the depth we have a lot of magnetite a little bit higher up it's uh, more hematite and we also have a quite large portion of appetite that we can utilize um, here is the critical to get the, get this in operation find find a method maybe combined with backfilling so that we don't get the impact on the surf, negative impact on the surface. Um, that kind of paste plant will that definitely be the, the largest in the world um, to kind of manage the, the scale of this operation. And we are investigating the possibility to connect this to the Edison Kiruna mine uh, that is like five kilometers away. Um, so uh, developing of this is undergoing right now. And of course we have the Kiruna underground mine, which is the largest mine we operate at, at the moment. Uh, we have quite a lot of reserves and also uh, a quite large portion of resources. And uh, we look into increasing mine product, the, the production to get lower with the new main haulage level and get the infrastru infrastructure necessary, infrastructure in place, new hoisting systems and connect it to the Perrier, per, possible Perrier mine. Um, all these mine projects, we need that to ensure the capability of production beyond 2060, which makes us make it possible for us to carry the investments in the transformation program. So how will it look when we start to transform our production site into CO2-free production? Of course, we have the pellet plants. We need to switch from fossil fuel into a CO2-free alternative. 
and we have different technologies so we are working in in different streams to develop that um, Christy mentioned oxygen can be a boost in the pelletizing plant um, but right now here in Gällivare we are looking into the first demonstration plant for CO2 free sponge iron production based on this hybrid technology at the same time we are looking on a review of the Svappavara system will it also be possible to to at least take part of that production into a CO2 free sponge iron production and later on we will also transform the Kiruna system but of course we have a lot of challenges in this permitting power supply we need there even though it's a surplus of power in this area we need to have the grid in place and all kind of installations for that this is a, a reference I mean it's quite a big portion of industrial scale projects that I have mentioned we have to prove that we are confident that we can do it is that we have we have done this in the past we, we supplied lump ore and fines products until the beginning of the 60s but from the mid 60s and until 2010 we have transformed the former production model into the pelletizing and uh, we have continued to improve the processes of pelletizing the plant we built in Svappavara 1969 had a normal capacity of 1.8 million tons per year but through continuous improvements today we are operating at double capacity in Svappavara with, an, with the same old plant and that we think is necessary to continue the collaboration with the uh, hybrid development to continue to increase the efficiency in all in all processes that we need for CO2 free uh, sponge iron production so the demonstration plant will not be the so to say final design for the Kiruna plants it will be the first design um, and the investment program I was responsible for starting with the main haulage level we have in Kiruna mine, Malmberit mine, in pelletizing plants MK3 and KK4 it was kind of a 15 year program and we invested like six and a half billion euros in that during that time and we are now more than doubling that uh, each month with a start here in Gällivare so what are we doing here in Gällivare uh, we are actually ramping up the this um, pre-feasibility study that hybrid development is performing we will have the final reports in the end of June and, and run through them together during August to prepare to start the, the feasibility study in, in uh, this autumn uh, we have taken some decisions within LKB to prepare for, for this also to get uh, some areas for for the demonstration plant and the following plant at the Yellowware site also some space for the hydrogen production here locally in in at our Yellowware site but of course the final investment decision will be linked into the environmental permits for our own for the, for the sponge iron production also for the electrical supply we need to have the power here before we can push the bottom uh, so we think round 24 that we will be able to take that decision and then the implementation will start 
and it will take a couple of years and then it's commissioning for the first CO2 free completely hydrogen based sponge iron product. So we have the focus on the en environmental and power supply. We need to find a skilled personnel, technical, both for technical and product development. We need to work through the local businesses that are here in Yellow are also to, to help us to achieve this. And we will continue to drive the innovation in parallel tracks and, and the aim is actually to, to try always to, to take the most cost efficient and sustainable value chain forward. I think I stopped there. Thank you, Jan. Um, I, I start with a question because I have a chance. What are the key drivers for your ambitions forward? For the sponge, uh, the CO2 free is the su making the sustainability as our business for real. Yeah. Because I think there is a demand already out there, but there are no products. So that's the key driver. And, and uh, I guess we have the ore for it. We have clean ore bodies. Through that, we have, in the pilot scale, proven that the process works, and we have customers already knocking at our door. You're starting the green transformation. Yes. Good. Uh, we have some questions from the floor. We can have one or two, uh, please. Thank you so much. So my name is. My name is Lebo Hang. I'm from Business Sweden. Um, I like the fact that you mentioned that the path that you always looking for is the one that is cost efficient and also sustainable. But um, my question to you is, don't you find it a little bit difficult because often things that are more sustainable when it comes to cost, they are more costly. So how do you then prioritize between the two? Has there ever been a clash um, between these two pillars that you base yeah. your decisions on? Yeah. I guess definitely if, if you, you, you need to look in, in the total uh, loop of this, the, the, the circle around, if, if you look at on a short term, there might be conflicts. But in the long run, I think the sustainable and the cost efficiency will, will drive each other. To oh. We have a more open question here also. Please. MAN Energy Solutions. So uh, during all the presentation yesterday and also today, uh, we uh, have heard this type of statements, you know, uh, a surplus of electricity production and low cost energy. The question is for how long these uh, statements will be valid? Because now we, uh, during the uh, presentation, we learned about a lot of new projects. We are talking about, you know, hundreds of uh, new megawatts and also terab uh, you know, uh, terawatts. So what will be the source of this new extra demand? I think that's also some quite huge uh, interest in, in uh, participate and make this fly because we also know that there are a lot of initiatives to increase the production of, of uh, um, CO2 free energy in, in this region as well on land and in, uh, on, on offshore. So I think uh, we need to do this together with, uh, with the external partners as well. Okay, we have one last uh, question, someone? Maybe Mox? Yes, uh, as is the tradition. <laughs> uh, may I ask, please, could you comment on your distribution, how that looks when you're producing your uh, fossil-free product, how you will move that to your customers? Uh, is the distribution in place in shipping particular? Yeah, I guess uh, if, if you go for this uh, HBI product, uh, that route is in place more or less. Of course, we are dependent on like products uh, of the port of Luleå that they uh, that they actually perform and, and uh, make that because we need uh, we need more uh, peers. Uh, also, we can have different kind of setups with the uh, depots, 
if if there will be a lot of customers in continental Europe and so on. Uh, if we go the other route, no, there still will be some development on how to transport the product, yes. But there are some existing today as well. Thank you, Jan Lundgren, for an interesting presentation. A big hand for him. Three really interesting presentation, how to go from talk to action. Now, now we are going from some action. We have lunch. Uh, we have lunch at the same place that you have Swedish Fika uh, and the bottom floor. And uh, I welcome back 1220. It will be interesting, so be back before 1220. Now, break for lunch.
We had a good lunch and uh, we are planning to start up the second session. Welcome back. Uh, I feel like this will be a really interesting and um, breathtaking session, I think. So, we hope. We hope. So, um, let's get going. Alexander, please. Yes, as you heard before lunch, there are some uh, pretty large scale industrial investments going on here in Gällivare. And we like to continue to talk a little about what spin-off effects and how we as a society can meet those investments. So, Roger, we divided those into four areas that we will work in. Yeah, for, for yeah, make a success in the green transformation, we have four different areas. They are on the screen. Sustainability is one for sure. The next one is uh, establishment. So we have houses for the people coming to Yellowvore. The third one is growth. Uh, especially in this place, we need skill setup, as uh, Rickard talking about earlier today. Uh, what education is here in Yellowvore, and what skill sets do the company need for the future? And other. Third thing, last thing is, uh, I think today is a perfect day to tell you about Yellowvare. So this is uh, the attraction part. This is the four different parts we have. Yeah, and we will go a little deeper down in the area sustainability. Because actually this, uh, this area we have divided in two areas. First, sustainable society. And we have three reasons or opportunities that's being available to us here in Gällivare with those large investments. Uh, Gällivare will be the world's largest producer of green hydrogen. Taste that. It's pretty unique, we think. It's, it's going to give a lot of opportunities for our business here. We have a good access to renewable electricity. And as you know, the hydroelectric power station, the largest in Sweden, are loca located between Gällivare and Jokmok. So much of why we see the big investments here is because we have a good accessibility to green energy. And last, we have the waste heat. And that's maybe one of the most interesting uh, area that we will focus on. So we see that we as a society and municipality and city, uh, the way it is, it's one of the key to become a sustainable and climate neutral city by 2030. Even though we know that LKAB don't want to create any waste heat, but as the process seems uh, sees today with the technology we have today, we know there's going to be some waste heat. If you are flipping to the business side, I think the presentation this, uh, before this break we had shows that um, we are actually in, in a green transformation of the mining and steel industry. And uh, we are doing it in, in Gällivare. So if we see in the business side, we want to be a center of business uh, excellence in sustainability. We have something called Kunskapscentrum for Hållbarhet. It's a cooperation be between CSR Sweden and the business region Gällivare. Then we inspire and educate small and mid-sized companies to take the big next step for, for a sustainable business. The other one is the objectives that we are really aiming for is to achieve 2,500 more permanent jobs to the 2030 in the green sector. And we are working hard for that. And the last one is to the spin-off and the synergies of this green transformation is obvious new establishment. That is a really interesting area, is it so? It is certainly so. Uh, but first, to make all this possible, we need good partners. We need to be good partners. And we need new partners. So maybe some of you here, new partners, can be interesting of hearing what will happen here in Gällivare. Oh, and maybe there's a hint of truth that we know that doesn't uh, 
like to talk so much. We prefer to do things. Uh, and I have to honestly say, one year ago, I couldn't imagine that this, in my wildest dream, that this would be possible in the Arctic town of Gällivare. But it's happening. The future is already here, and we would like to welcome up Thomas Parker, CEO from WARM, to tell us more about what you can do with waste heat. Welcome up. So. Thank you guys so much. Um, if you ever uh, go on tour, we'd like to hire you as a moderator team. You're, you're, this is just fantastic. Um, hi everybody, uh, glad to meet you all. My name is Thomas Parker and I'm one of the founders of WARM. Uh, the other two are in the room and, I'll, I'll, and some others as well. I'll get to presenting them eventually. Uh, and WARM uh, is an impact company and uh, we like to talk about waste to life. And I'll uh, explain to you what that means. But first, uh, I know you all know this and um, it's kind of a downer, but just to lay the, the, the framework and uh, really why we're all here is that of course the planet and the society is facing huge challenges uh, of which some are urgent. And uh, I know we've all talked about and are in the, the climate space, um, but I just want to point to as well that are important to us are issues of biodiversity, which are, are bubbling and almost equally urgent. But also what we like to talk about, and I, I think some of you will recognize, is that the development, the development part of sustainable development because we, we can't achieve, get to where we need to be in terms of uh, climate, biodiversity, whatever, by standing still. We need to move forward. And, and of course, uh, we're not the only people who have realized that, uh, those of us here, uh, this is all the topic of, of uh, global leadership. But just hearing the other speakers, um, I know that we all agree that the, that the glo global leadership, the, the, the PACs, the, the, uh, the uh, meetings are all absolutely essential, but then someone has to do the work. And, and I understand that a lot of those people in the room, and, and um, what I'm really here to say is that we want to be one of them. Um, uh, because we think that WARM can help. And, and so what, what, is, what is WARM? Well, we, we develop and uh, finance industrial scale and um, circular uh, businesses is what we do. And the effects of this that we can see is, is, is our fast and lasting uh, climate effect. And uh, I think if uh, poor Niklas who's operating the clicker, is, he's, he's caught up, that's great. Uh, you see a graph there, um, and it's really just something we, sort of the back of the envelope, started calculating that um, if we at WARM uh, could uh, put in place the project portfolio we had, and this is before we got talking to, to folks up here, is that we see that we, by recycling industrial waste streams, um, the climate impact that we would make doesn't solve all the problems, but it does move the needle. So, so this is just a back of the envelope calculation about the total Swedish emissions, and then we see the effects of our, our little piece of the puzzle, and it's substantial. But the, it, it, what might be interesting to you is what we do, recycling waste heat from industry, it's a quick, it's a fast action for industry. So the industries we've been working with see that they can take those first steps towards a, uh, on their climate journey uh, that we saw some descriptions of earlier today. Uh, and it's a fairly easy step because uh, when we work with industry, we say that uh, we try to be a, a one-stop shop uh, so that the, we don't ask the industry to invest or do much more than show us where we can install some heat exchangers and, 
and with uh, older established industries, the big the big problem is usually where to put the pipes out to get to get out of the old industrial site. Um, but uh, what's what we really like is that we work with low grade waste heat, which is future proof. Uh, in that, when the industries uh, start their journeys, and the older industries um, that haven't come as far as, as fun of the, some of the folks presenting here, uh, maybe take their first steps with recycling waste heat, and then start on a journey of electrification and renewable uh, raw materials and all that. But as, as we were, uh, Alexander was just saying, there's still a waste heat element. And that is typically the low-grade stuff when you're using electrical system. And that means we can still be there all those years uh, later when everything else is renewable. And then you can actually conceptually uh, think about getting beyond that zero point and actually becoming a, a, a net sink. So the question I most often get when presenting warm is what about this three in the name? Um, because we pronounce warm, but there is a crazy little three there. And that's our, that's our, uh, that's our backstory, that's our history. Uh, because we were born at uh, something called the European Spallation Source, uh, which is a, a large scale research facility down in, in, right in the other end of Sweden. And, um, our job, and I say our because the, the three founders of WARM assembled there, our job was to make that a sustainable research facility by implementing uh, an energy concept called responsible, renewable, and recyclable. So it's three R's. That's why the three is there uh, and confuses everybody. Yeah. And the story of ESS, if you ever get a chance, is, is I would say, as exciting as some of the stuff we've, we've heard here. Uh, pushing the envelope of what is possible with science. Uh, but that's a different story, so I'd love to tell it someday, but it won't be now. Um, so we talk about the waste to life and in, on an industrial scale, and w why do we say that? Well, our, our job at ESS, and since then, has been to recycle waste heat. But my background is in, is in physics, and I struggle to find a good way to use uh, waste heat uh, at low temperatures to do anything useful with. And, um, but then uh, because I brought in some folks who were not so deep into physics, uh, even if it was at the SS, um, they, they found the solution, which is in biology. Because uh, it turns out low-grade waste heat uh, isn't a much use to make uh, something move, um, but it is useful for uh, causing organisms to grow. So we add a little temperature on various levels depending on the organism, you get more growth. So it's very useful for farming um, in that respect. But also uh, the other great um, invention of biology is photosynthesis. And um, we have very few greenhouses in Sweden because even if today is a fine day here, much of the year is on the cool side uh, if you're a tomato uh, or, <laughs> or pretty much anything else. Uh, so it's been difficult to grow uh, vegetables in greenhouses here uh, just because the heating costs are so large. So there you can use low-grade waste heat, heat up a, a greenhouse, and you're um, suddenly good to go. Do we have 30 seconds for a quick story? Uh, for, this is an ESS story. I have to, when we were at ESS, we spent a lot of time with, um, at, at CERN, uh, the, the big uh, circular particle accelerator. Uh, ESS was gonna be, will be when it's up and running, the world's most powerful linear particle accelerator. CERN is a little bigger, but we had a lot of uh, good interaction. And we had one meeting about, uh, um, about energy, all the energy stuff we could do, and there's lots of energy research and fun stuff there. And they had some really wild ideas of uh, keeping energy in, in um, superconducting loops and that sort of thing. So really clever stuff. And uh, I was there at a seminar, and I was sitting up at a podium like this. I was alone, and then there was a room full of people, and they all went around the table. Everyone told their clever things, and I was, I was thinking, what am I going to say? 
at the end, I was just say, well, you guys are really clever. We can't do all that stuff. All we do is recycle the waste heat. And then what happened, I saw uh, Sergey, who was head of cryogen uh, cryogenics, he, he took his arm and he cleared the table in front of him. And he took his, an empty sheet of paper and pointed to it and said, tell us how to do that, because we can't do that at CERN. But that's just it. They're into physics, right? It's biology. So now you remember that. <laughs> so here's how it works. We start with the waste heat. We also go to industries and we look at, well, what else is there? Uh, those uh, ancient industries that still have combustion processes, sometimes we can get some CO2 out of that, which is very good for a greenhouse. Um, and then we also create, sometimes there are things that can be used as, as nutrients or drive other biological systems. But what our background is we start with the waste heat. So we, and then we add on circles uh, that we can loop around depending on what we figure out that we can do. But I think the most important thing is that we don't really do this. We do this, we add others uh, to help us out. So it's a partnership. Um, so what we really do is we're, we're a facilitator or an integrator. And we have a business model which brings together um, the industries uh, with, with uh, waste resources and heat and growers, farmers uh, that can make use of that, but perhaps are not so very used to uh, operating in Sweden or interacting with uh, industries, a different, different sort of business uh, model. And then the third critical factor, of course, is the money, so pulling down the finance uh, into that. Uh, so those are the, the key ingredients. And, and what we find then is we, we create a win, 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 win. Because we have these three parties, if we start with the industry, uh, they get, as I said, those first steps, those easy steps towards the sustainable future that they need to, to go to and understand that they need to go to. To the farmers, uh, they get a big slice out of their costs uh, because waste heat is, uh, will be cheaper than whatever heat, heat form they have. And uh, this message is pretty clear right now to the greenhouse growers down in the Netherlands who are operating on natural gas, and, and many of them not hedge their gas prices because they don't think in those terms. Um, they're good at tomatoes and peppers. Um, so, so the message of a stable, low uh, energy price is attractive. The planet gains, I'm not even going to go into that. You all know this. Uh, but we also society gains, and we see that, uh, as some people were talking about, as industry uh, moves to um, more um, sustainable uh, future, that requires tech, that requires, uh, you, you're actually, someone was talking about actually shedding personnel that were driving the trucks, and so what, but what we create is uh, our businesses coupled to that, that, that uh, need uh, partially a, a different skill set. Uh, first of all, all the biology, so we have uh, that bit and, and growing, which, which are um, uh, different people. Because, and, and that's good, because everyone cannot or does not want to work at a mine, uh, so we need, we need a mix. Uh, but also we create jobs uh, like picking tomatoes, which don't require uh, the same, the same uh, level of skill set. Um, so what this puzzle that we put together um, is, uh, we find is, uh, well, first of all, it, it's obvious, but it needs saying that um, recycling waste heat works best in cool climates. It's, it's a hard sell with if you have 40 degree heat and it's 40 degrees outside, as it is in, in Spain uh, currently, I hear. So they're not so interested. So uh, we need that. Uh, green electricity is good for just about everyone. Um, but things like water and land, which are scarce resources, are uh, a little less scarce in, uh, in Sweden. And if you turn around, don't do it right now, or you can if you like, but there, there is water and land uh, in, in, um, in abundance in Sweden compared to many other places. Um, so those are the factors that we need to make this work. Um, but then the waste heat from industry is, is the, the missing piece of that puzzle to get that, that system to work. 
And then what we do is we just get those pieces of the puzzle to, to come together into one. Now, this is actually not our first ra rodeo, as we say back in the States. Um, uh, we, we have a, a, a project um, uh, that is currently going into construction uh, down in uh, Flevi. And you see, uh, we, we actually go, takes us a few hours going north uh, to get to Flevi, but as you see on a map uh, from, from this perspective, it's southern Sweden. Uh, but uh, the numbers there are that we will be recycling a 10 megawatt flow of heat, and then out of that we get make use of 50 gigawatt hours per year uh, in, for um, uh, a prawn farm and a greenhouse and produce, what is it, 12,000 tons of, of uh, good uh, premium quality food out of that. Um, and, and there was a, not so long ago, we thought of that as a big project. Um, and in, in its, uh, we, we had a, a groundbreaking ceremony We've uh, attracted a, a, a bit of attention, uh, again, not perhaps on the level of, of what's going on here, but still, um, and uh, a, a, good, a great deal of support uh, and um, enthusiasts, one of which happens to be a, a, a minister in the Swedish government, and who went so far as saying that what we, what we do is of, of strategic importance uh, for Sweden, which is... Uh, heartening, but also a bit, uh, almost a bit scary. So, what are we doing here? <laughs> Unannounced until now. Um, well, here's how I see it. We, we started ESS, a game changer in science, and uh, early on, uh, working with some uh, colleagues in the in the, in the metals industry, uh, way down in our end of Sweden. Uh, we came to hear about uh, what, were plan, what were in the plans here. And uh, since we were part of moving the, moving the envelope in terms, of, um, in terms of science, we really want to be part of moving the envelope in terms of what industry uh, can do. And uh, so this is where we want to be. And uh, um, this is what we want to do. So that's why we're here. Um, there's clearly it's early days, lots of work to be done. And we hear that uh, uh, it's not, we're not uh, in any way close to anything to say exactly what can be done. Uh, but uh, um, uh, it's time to start. So just to summarize, um, what we do is we work with industrial, it's circular, it's at scale, and we work together in, uh, we create symbiosis. So we work, move together towards uh, sustainability. And just to end up, um, we definitely feel a sense of urgency. Um, the, and we, uh, we like to say that we, we have no time for waste, but also there is no time to waste. And uh, before I open up for some uh, questions, I just want to, uh, so you can direct your questions in, in uh, different directions. One uh, proof of the sense of urgency that we feel is we brought half the company. And I just want to point out to some people that we got, can wave. Uh, Frederick and Misha together, uh, the, the other two founders uh, of WARM uh, that I recruited to ESS uh, uh, once. We have uh, on beside them uh, Ivan, who is our head of uh, business development, and uh, somewhere, somewhere I'm uh, my boss. Uh, no, yeah, I'm going to get the. Uh, there he is. <laughs> Am I doing okay? Yeah, uh, Jacques is the Jacques, Jacques is the chairman of the board uh, in here, and uh, last but not least, possibly in height, uh, but but last but not least, uh, Ingrid, um, and you know she's the only woman here, and and so then you know that she's the one that actually does the work, 
so she uh, is in charge of executing on the projects. Um, so we're ecstatic to be here. This is the most exciting thing that's going on that we've identified in, in industry at all. So uh, again, we're here to help, and there's no time to waste. Thank you. Exciting, Thomas. Maybe we have some questions from the floor. Mox. <laughs> Who else? Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, just personally, I've always been interested. Do you find it uh, interesting to design greenhouses for the conditions here in the north? Heating them is one issue, but to design them so that they take the snow load uh, in an efficient way, is that something that you have to, to research specifically? Short answer is yes, um, and uh, there is a lot of work going on uh, in that, uh, that we're following but not driving. Uh, but, uh, but there are also even the, uh, the established uh, uh, growers and uh, uh, suppliers of greenhouses have uh, identified this as well. So we, we've, uh, uh, the ones that we're working with in, in uh, Flevi uh, have concepts both for low-grade waste heat and for for snow load. Although that is, the snow load part is mostly just about melting it, uh, which is uh, perhaps a bit wasteful of heat. So I think there's more to be done. I think you had a question before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this was actually what I was thinking about then. But yes, uh, I'm a bit curious about your business model. How do you make your Money? Do you sell your expertise or become a partner in the company that's created, or how does it look like? It's a bit of both. Uh, so we uh, develop uh, these projects um, conceptually and all the way at, until the something investable. Um, and uh, usually the projects, uh, because the growers don't tend to be very flush with cash, uh, the project will involve the entire infrastructure uh, for the growing and all the piping and pumps and things like that. So the whole greenhouse, uh, fish farm, what have you. Uh, and then uh, the first opportunity to get paid is when we present that to financiers. Then a, a, a fairly sizable chunk of cash changes hand and we can just take a little bit of it. Uh, but then we also uh, very much like to be involved in the, in the activities long term and look at, can we put in new loops? Can we improve? What more can we do if there's something going wrong? Uh, so we, we do have an involvement and, a, and an income from a, a bit of that as well. We have more, one more question here. Uh, are you finding sort of, lo <coughs> excuse me, local growers who presumably are not used to um, tomato and pepper crops in greenhouses, or are you finding growers from other regions who are used to that business model and trying to bring them here? Uh, the, the latter. I mean, we've, we've worked with um, or, and had long talks with local growers as well. But uh, in terms of greenhouses, that because greenhouses have been, it's been such a poor business case in Sweden for, that we've really lost a generation. Um, so there's just not really the skill set to operate a modern uh, greenhouse today. So, so Short term there, we're, we're, we'll bring in folks from the Netherlands to on a top level and then sort of ramp up the knowledge base here. Um, fish farming, uh, on land fish farming is, is a fairly fairly new phenomenon, so there's not really a, there's not a huge uh, base of people who can walk in and, and uh, run and <coughs> design a whole uh, large scale fish farm. So there we, we, we just look worldwide for the expertise there. We have a custom word yeah. here. When you mentioned the second time around uh, the Dutch people, I felt inclined to ask a question. <laughs> um, so a very practical one. How far away can the greenhouses be from the actual facility? Because I think it's, it's going to be, I don't know, do I have to see a greenhouse next to the hybrid facility, or how far away can it be? Thanks. In, um in the cases we've been uh, working on uh, before, 
we've said within a kilometer or two. Uh, but it, it scales a bit with the amount of heat, so the size and also the temperature. So in, in the Hebleed case, if we um, have the right figures in terms of, of, of both the scale and the, and the temperatures available, we think we can move uh, significantly further. Do we have some more yeah. questions? Yes, yes, we have. Sorry for that. Sorry. Uh, Jens Wartmann from the Center of uh, Fuel Cells Research in Hydrogen. Uh, what is about the CO2 emissions from the logistics from the tomatoes? I mean, if you bring it down uh, to uh, Botrop, to my hometown, is 3,000 kilometers uh, with a diesel LKW. I mean, is this still then a business model? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question here. In, in our case in Flevi, we were bringing tomatoes a lot closer to the, to the consumer uh, uh, here, so we, there's a substantial savings. Clearly, there is a potential here to build um, greenhouses for, for a lot more tomatoes than will be consumed locally, uh, so it, it's a valid point. Uh, on the other hand, there's a there's a, there is a system of logistics for some pretty heavy stuff uh, moving uh, moving out of here that we would like to try to tap into. But I, I don't have that's it's 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 early days uh, to say that. Uh, and uh, but I think that you're definitely onto something, especially for tomatoes um, are a bit tricky to transport, so that might be a, that might be turn out to be a limiting factor. Um, fish products are easier. In that you can, um, no, uh, all fish you eat has been frozen, put it that way. So it's that that does make it easier. It's still weight that needs to be moved, though. Okay, I think we will give Thomas a big applause. Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you to you to take that you took the time and take a stop here in Gällivare. And I know you have to go on, on the coaches and uh, go to Kiruna is the next stop. So we from the municipality of Gällivare and business region Gällivare would like to thank you for staying here and hear about what's happening here. Thank you for today. Thank you. Short practical uh, thing, uh, please remember your stuff.
Vi är ju några stycken här idag men vi är jätteglada att kunna ha den. Med oss har vi Gällivare kommun, vi har Gällivare näringsliv och vi ska snart inleda och prata lite. Vi har Gällivare energi som kommer ha också ett framförande. Och sen kommer Fredrik inte Betov och Mikael Wigert från Warm prata om spillvärmeprojektet. Mer kommer vi ha hybrid och LKAB som finns tillgängliga här under träff, pressträffen om det uppkommer frågor som blir ställda till dem. Så varmt välkommen hit och jag lämnar ordet till Birgitta. Ja, men tack Alexander. Jag ska också säga varmt välkomna till dagens presskonferens som gäller vare kommun tillsammans med vårt kommunala bolag gäller vare Energi AB samt LKAB och Warm och gäller vare näringsliv har kallat till. Och från kommunen så deltar då jag, Birgitta Larsson, som är kommunstyrelsens ordförande. Vi har också här på min vänstra sida Janet Weppling som är vice ordförande i kommunstyrelsen. Och på min högra sida har jag Henrik Ulvebo som är andra vice ordförande i kommunstyrelsen. Och vi kallar oss till vardags för kommunalråd. De, ja Monica har vi också, Flodström som är kommundirektör. Så klart får vi inte glömma bort henne. Det är många som vi ska komma ihåg idag. De övriga som får presentera sig själv när det blir dags för dem att berätta om de stora sakerna vi ska vi har kallat det till för. Och om en liten stund så kommer vi att få ta del av en otroligt spännande möjlighet som kan skapa många nya arbetstillfällen som också ger oss ett breddat och mer dynamiskt näringsliv. Och vi ser framåt med glädje hur många följdinvesteringar, synergieffekter och arbetsmöjligheter som uppkommer i samband med industrins omställning. Och tillsammans med de satsningarna på fossilfritt stål så kommer den här satsningen vi kommer att få höra om idag där spillvärmen kommer att tas tillvara säkra upp framtiden för Gällivare kommun för en väldigt, väldigt lång tid framöver. Och Gällivare kommer att ligga i framkant vad gäller de gröna omställningarna. Det är ett som är säkert. Det är väldigt positivt det här. Och det här ger enorma möjligheter för oss i kommunen och för vårt näringsliv. Och nu ska jag lämna över till Janet. Varsågod. Det är såklart, vi vill ju alla säga några ord om den här fantastiska eh, saken som kommer att presenteras här idag. Det är ju otroligt spännande. Och det är ju satsningar som kommer att eh, bidra till Norrbotten och ja, faktiskt hela Sveriges självförsörjningsgrad gällande livsmedelsproduktion. Och det är ju helt rätt i tiden. Det kommer ju också att öka intresset för Gällivare som ort. När man, vi öppnar upp för en helt ny bransch. Vilket är fantastiskt. Och så vill såklart Henrik också säga någonting. Ja, det är otroligt spännande att stå här idag. Vi såg ju tidigt potentialen kring, kring de här satsningarna. Att det fanns mycket att göra. Att nu vara här mitt i den gröna omställningen och se hur... Vi tillsammans med industrin och näringslivet kan skapa cirkulära flöden som, som skapar värde för, för alla. Så att vi lever mitt i den gröna omställningen och, och nu blir det praktik av det vi tidigare har fantiserat och, och önskat. Så med det lämnar jag över till Tommy. Varsågod. Tack för det. Tommy Nyström, ordförande gäller vår energi. Det pågår ju en förstudie nu hur man ska kunna ta rätt på den här restvärmen eller spillvärmen från LKBs anläggningar inför framtiden och integrera det gäller våra energis redan befintliga fjärrvärmenät som är ganska långt. Sen är det ju så här också att fjärrvärmen kommer att bli en möjliggörare för mycket andra projekt och områden för affärer kanske runt om i kommunen eftersom fjärrvärmen våran når ut till så många i kommunen. Vi täcker ju upp jättestora delar av gäller våra kommuner med vårt fjärrvärmenät. 
okej. Okay. Och vi hoppas ju på att det här ska gå vägen och bli något riktigt bra för både gäller vår kommun och Värmeverk. Tack. Och då lämnar vi över ordet till Warm. Ja. Jag tror vi ska ha något litet material också. En, en, en liten show. Där ja. Eh, oro är inte, det är inte samma bilder som vi har visat innan som Thomas pratade till. Tack så jättemycket för att eh, vi får vara här idag. Tackar särskilt eh, Gällivare kommun, eh, Gällivare Energi, eh, LKAB, alla som, som är här eh, och verkar till dagligdags. Vi är eh, gäster här nu. Jag hoppas vi kan vara här mycket, mycket mer under väldigt lång tid framöver och jobba tillsammans med er. Jag heter Michel Wigert, eh, en av tre grundare. Vi har Fredrik Indubeto här och Thomas har ni redan eh, lyssnat på. Eh, när han inte pratar amerikanska så pratar han skånska. Eh, så vi tänkte att det är bättre att jag kör här eh, till att börja med. <laughs> ja, eh, jag tänkte att jag skulle berätta lite grann eh, som en liten ingress till hur tänkte vi göra det här då. Så, eh, och berätta lite grann vad, vad Warm är för någonting. Eh, förresten, jag tror jag gör som så att jag överlämnar det till Fredrik. Varsågod. Ja, hej. Tack för att vi får vara här. Jag ska bara kort dra igenom det här, vad vi gör. Eden ska hålla lite närmare då, så blir det bättre. Det vi gör är att vi återvinner industriella restströmmar och ger dem egentligen man kan säga, ett nytt liv genom att skapa via biologiska processer ja, livsmedelsprodukter. Och för att få lite mer, jag ställer mig till på sidan så kan vi se vad jag, vad jag tror jag pratar om. Typiskt så har vi en stor industri som avger restvärme och eventuellt andra reströmmar. Till exempel koldioxid i vårt andra projekt som ligger söderut i södra Sverige. Från den så hämtar vi värme och koldioxid som är väldigt viktiga ingredienser när man håller på med storskalig produktion av livsmedel i växthus eller fiskodlingar. Sen skapar vi cirkulära system mellan de här enheterna. På andra sidan här ser ni att det finns ett vattenbruk, eller i det här fallet så är det en räkodling för 4 000 ton i det här projektet i Fröve. I växthuset producerar vi grönsaker som tomater, i det här fallet 8 000 ton ungefär per år. Och sen bildas det i, blir det ju en avkylningseffekt på den här energin som vi utvinner så det levereras faktiskt en kall loop tillbaka till industrin. Och därmed har vi slutet ett cirkulärt system. Det här är, är en, ger på de här norra breddgranar där vi är så är det värmen som låser upp andra fördelar som finns här uppe som vi har nämnt tidigare som tillgång till grön energi. Och relativt sett så finns det faktiskt vatten och mark. Det vi, vi får jämföra lite mer globalt sett när det gäller de här frågorna. Och det här tillsammans skapar ett fantastiskt system för produktion av livsmedelsråvaror som i Sverige är helt centralt. Vi har en väldigt låg självförsörjningsgrad och nu håller vi på att öka den. Så det här är ett väsentligt bidrag till den processen i utvecklingen. Jag tänkte vi kan dela lite på de här frågorna bara, eller gå igenom. Se om den här funkar. Ja, det funkar. Båda två. Ja, det finns ju en massa olika så att säga, aktörer här som har stora fördelar av detta. Jag tänkte vi skulle ta och gå igenom det lite grann. Det här handlar ju faktiskt till syvende och sist om hållbarhet både idag men också för en väldigt, väldigt lång tid framöver. Det tycker jag ligger i själva ordet hållbar. Det är ingenting som sker momentant och sen är det slut utan det är någonting som pågår väldigt, väldigt länge. Och då kan man titta då på för industrin. Ja, vi sker, det sker ju i Sverige idag en, en grön omvandling. Industrin elektrifieras och digitaliseras och... Då behöver vi också implementera systemförändringar. Och en systemförändring är just det här med att det får nästan vara slut på det här med att man, man skickar ut sina överskott eller det som är avfall så att säga, ut i naturen eller närmsta vattendrag eller, eller sjö. Det är en fantastisk resurs med överskottsvärme. Låt oss använda den och bygga in det i systemet från början så att systemdesignen är rätt från början. Det är det vi försöker hjälpa till med. Det ger ett reducerat klimatavtryck. Industrin kan ta ytterligare ett steg mot att bli, gå mot nettoutsläpp. Svensk industri är väldigt, väldigt duktig internationellt sett. Man har kommit väldigt, väldigt långt med att göra sin process så effektiv som möjligt. Så man 
förbruka så lite el som möjligt. Men för att ta nästa steg så behöver man nästan addera någonting, en extern aktör. Vi, skulle, vi är en sån aktör. Och det är ju också en förbättrad hållbarhet, det pratade jag om lite grann innan. Om vi tar nästa punkt, matproducenter. Fredrik. Ja, du är tillbaka till matproduktionen och eh, som vi nämnde tidigare så har vi en låg självförsörjningsgrad i synnerhet på grönsaker och fisk eh, har vi stora problem i de marina habitaten. Så den här värmen som vi nu kommer återvinna skapar möjligheter att helt enkelt börja producera hållbart. Om man tittar på en ganska nyligen publicerad rapport från FN så står agrisektorn för ungefär 31 procent av de totala CO2-emissionerna. Det är alltså en sektor som släpar efter och det vi skapar med det här cirkulära systemet är att vi får ju i princip en eh, noll utsläpp av bilproduktionstillfället vilket är den stora miljövinsten. Och därmed så skapar vi hållbar produktion så det här är i alla avseenden en framtid. Och eftersom vi tappar in i den här stora industriella omställningen så kommer vi ha de här råvarorna tillgängliga för lång tid framöver. Det, man kan prata om en marknadsnärvaro också. Vi, vi saknar den här kompetensen i Sverige att odla i de här högindustriella miljöerna. Och den är nu på väg in så att vi kommer jobba lokalt med företag som redan är ganska stora och är i produktion. Men det innebär också att det sker en kunskapsöverföring in till Sverige. Vilket är ganska fantastiskt bara det. Och sen kort kan man säga, de här multiloparna som skapas, det är ju inte bara själva råvarorna i sig utan det skapas ett annat så att säga, kretslopp mellan de här olika enheterna som till exempel näringsämnen. Och det är i sin tur ju på både till innovation och förbättrar avtrycket. Nästa område, <coughs> miljön då. Ja, det har vi ju redan pratat om här men det vi gör i slutändan gör ju att avfall och restprodukter de minskar, för vi använder ju dem. Vi ser dem som en, en fantastisk resurs att kunna använda för odling av, av grönsaker och av fisk. Vi undviker också koldioxidutsläpp. Eh, om man tar ett ex exempel till frö, vi jobbar där med en holländsk eh, odlare. Eh, alternativet för dem hade varit att bygga ytterligare växthus i Holland. De växthusen har hittills sett värmts upp naturgas, ofta rysk naturgas faktiskt. Vilket vi inte så, eh, inget vi vill hålla på med, eh, säkert inte i dessa tider. Eh, men istället så har de tyckt att ja, men det här är helt fantastiskt. Vi kan bygga ett växthus lokalt i Sverige nära våra konsumenter. Och vi kan dessutom värma upp det med överskottsvärme. Kan det bli mer grönt än så? Och det är ju också ett sätt att då att, förlåt du ville säga någonting. Varsågod. Nej, jag, jag tänkte hoppa över på nästa punkt som, i, som handlar egentligen om själva omställningen och effekterna av den. Och eh, hur det nu än är så kommer det krävas någon form av utveckling av jobb i de här objekten. Och det måste jag nog ändå säga ser det som en positiv möjlighet. För att i den här samhällsomvandlingen vi befinner oss i så behöver vi ha kopplade till människor också. Det, det kan inte bara vara teknik utan vi måste inkludera människor i den omställningen. Så det är för mig en ganska viktig fråga. Och det genererar också en sammanhållning och en utveckling av samhället generellt. Jag tror det är, tror vi är klara på den här punkten. Ja. Gäller var det då? Ja, här finns ju fantastiska planer framåt här. Vi har ju då ett nära samarbete med, med Gällivare kommun och Gällivare näringsliv baserat då på att ta hand om svillvärmen från hybrid. Det är stora mängder värme och det är ju då att själva vår satsning här kommer bli större än det man har gjort i Frövid. Ganska rejält. Som ni ser här så vi i första steget här så pratar vi om alltså att återvinna nästan en terawattimme spillvärme per år och det är en stor mängd verkligen. Det kommer skapas en massa nya gröna jobb, vilket kan vara, en, vara positivt. Man diversifierar näringslivet i, i Gällivare. Och vi kommer också, som sagt, som nämnts tidigare, då, producera livsmedel, eh, vilket hjälper till att öka självförsörjningsgraden. Inte bara här uppe i, i Norrland, men också för Sverige som helhet. Och kanske till och med för Norden. Och vi ligger nära de marknaderna. Gällivare är nära. Om man jämför med vad vi hämtar... Maten annars ifrån. Den kan komma från Spanien och Nordafrika och Holland för den delen. 
Och så tänker jag på nästa steg, för där är vi nog framme vid slutet här. Vi, vi befinner oss i en förstudie som ska fördjupas. Så vi faktiskt lite mer specifikt kan berätta vad, vad vi ska göra. Och när vi är klara med det så kommer det genomföras en konceptuell design. Och då, då blir det ganska tydligt. Så att här kommer vi ägna den kommande tiden åt. Och det ska faktiskt bli ett väldigt spännande arbete. Och jag ser fram emot att få presentera det i nästa steg. Och som avslutning då så... Säger vi, det finns ju faktiskt ingen tid att förlora. There is no time to waste. Jag leker lite grann med orden där. Men från 1990 till idag så har vi lyckats minska utsläppen i Sverige med 35 procent. Fram till 2045, det är en, en lite mindre tidsperiod, så har vi resten att ta hand om. Och det skapar en viss sense of urgency. Vi måste ju bara göra saker på ett nytt sätt. Och det är det vi försöker göra. Tack så mycket för att ni lyssnade. Men tack så mycket. Vi ska se om vi har ljud i den här. Vi öppnar upp för eh, frågor. Så de som vill ställa privata frågor till respektive part här så är det bara att komma fram och ställa dem. Tack. Tack. <laughs> tack. <laughs>